So we're going to move now into our first session where we're talking about how to make CCAM work. Um, and I mean, we've got an hour to answer that question. We might actually need a little bit longer, but we're going to give it a go anyway. We're talking about how to move CCAM towards deployment while maintaining safety, safeguarding legal aspects, and working with societal needs. So it is a multidisciplinary challenge, we've heard that. It is complex. All stakeholders need to be involved. That's vehicle manufacturers, road operators, local authorities, researchers, and there's the all-important social acceptance, and there are important legal aspects too. So let me first of all introduce our panel and then I'm actually going to ask you all a question, but let me uh, just introduce who's with us. We have uh, Joost van Tommer, who is the Smart Mobility Director from ASEA, which is the association representing car and truck manufacturers in Europe. Hello to you, Joost. We have Serge Van Damme, who is the Special Advisor to the Directorate General for Public Works and Water Management in the Netherlands. Uh, he's also the Chair of the Conference of European Directors of Road CEDA on, in the Connected and Automated Driving Group. So uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Sophie Venesten is the Director of Drive Sweden. I think we're a bit out of sync with, there you are. There you are, Sophie. Um, Drive Sweden, now it's, you'll tell us more about Drive Sweden, I know, but I, I, I can tell you that it's 150 partners from the business sector, society and academia to create safe and sustainable mobility systems. That's the official bit, but I'm sure you'll give us more insight into that. Sophie, thank you very much. And Jesse, Jessica uh, Uguzioni is the lead lawyer, Automated Vehicles Review at the Law Commission of England and Wales. The really important legal, we haven't talked about any of the legal sides so far, so really, really happy to have with you, Jessica, because there are so many things that need to be sorted out in, that, in, in legal terms. And we're also joined by Mohamed Mekjani, who is the Secretary General of the UITP, which is the International Association of Public Transport. And yours is an advocacy organisation, I think, with public transport operators, but bringing in policymakers and scientific institutes. So it's, it's, it's covering all bases and, um, for, for a real discussion from all the different stakeholders. Well, we will talk to you all in just a moment because I am going to just launch a Slido poll now. I want to ask you, all the people watching, everybody, this is the question. By 2030, automated mobility will be deployed at large scale in Europe. Now, when we mean automated, we mean high-level automated. If anyone's in, no, I mean, it's level four out of five. So it's quite a high level of automation that we are suggesting in this question. So do you totally agree? Do you slightly agree? Oh, we've got two slightly agrees. All right, uh, or totally disagree. No, sorry, slightly agree and slightly disagree. Totally disagree. Um, so. While you're filling that in, I'm going to talk to our panellists and then we will take a look at that. And we actually, we'll probably do this poll again um, at the end of the session just to see if anyone's changed their minds as a result of our discussions. So if you want to start um, filling in the, the Slido poll, it's an ambitious target, this. I think everybody knows that. But I think the whole idea is to be ambitious. So by 2030, do you think it will be deployed at large scale in Europe? So now let me bring in our panellists. Um, because I really want to ask you all one by one, in, very shortly, I mean, I'm giving you two or three minutes to do this, but what can you do to make CCAM work? And what would you need from others to make CCAM work? So we're talking here about the potential for partnership. Um, so, Jus, maybe you would like to start off from the vehicle manufacturer's perspective. Yes, thank you, Katie. Good morning. Hope you all hear me well. Um, allow me to thank the Commission uh, and thank you, Mr. Holloway, for the introduction today, but also Arcade, Artico, and the stakeholder community to make this a success the third time that we have this EUCAT 21 this year. Uh, our 15 members of ASEA, so the, the vehicle manufacturers, we believe in four things. One is safe mobility, smart mobility, sustainable and green mobility. I think that's the promise we keep. We commit to that, and I can tell you, I will give you some examples on how we do it. CCAM contains a lot of ingredients to cook the meal, and the kitchen is a big one with a lot of chef cocks. So we need to set, settle uh, who is actually orchestrating this and who has the lead and, and the rest. So um, we want to move from the vehicle-centric part, which is about building vehicles, 
to using vehicles for society with a capital S, with services. It's part of a larger ecosystem. I'm very happy to have all my friends and colleagues in this panel. And we have many pilots, not only for moving people, but also moving goods and moving data. And it's active in the passenger cars, in the light commercial vehicles. Let's uh, take the robot taxis, the, the um, city logistics, last mile delivery, but also in the high, uh, the, the HTV, so the high, um, the, the real, uh, the trucks and the buses. Thanks to Horizon 2020 and digital Europe programs in the future as well, uh, we'll make it happen. And I, I would say in terms of questions we have to make it happen, Katie, that was the question. I think we have five things, five big tickets. One is incubators. We need testing and piloting that we do today with a lot of, uh, of our members, uh, together with uh, UCAR, Ertico, and many others. It's about one-stop shopping and about interoperability. If I'm testing things for Ensemble with trucks in Spain, Portugal, and Greece, it should be testable and deployable and interoperable with other countries like Slovenia, Slovakia, or uh, Germany, for example. That's not yet the case. We have different rules in each of the country for testing for piloting. That's one. Second is regulation. Normally, we do not call for regulations as a European Trade Association, but this time we do. We want vehicle predictability, legal predictability. It's about use of technologies and use of spectrum in an efficient way, about interoperability systems. So we need to understand each other when we talk to each other in terms of vehicles and infrastructure. It's about data sharing mobility spaces that DG Move is working on. But more prominently, it's about automation and automated driving for public and private sector. We know that there is a draft regulation coming from DG Pro. It's actually on the table in the Motor Vehicle Working Group. We very much believe that we need to put this forward. If not, we've gone a lag behind. We already lag a bit behind Asia, United States as well a bit. Japan has the first level four, level five even, type approved car uh, on the road, actually. So I think we need to, to continue this. AI is another one. I'm expecting the Commission to adopt today its regulation on AI for automated transport systems. So that's another one. Regulation is not only about vehicles, but also about traffic rules. So we need optimization of these traffic rules, synchronization. They are not the same in each country. Some allow level four, even level five. Some others do not even allow uh, level three, conditional level three. So we need some more one-stop shopping for that. Third point is infrastructure. It's not only about vehicles using the roads, it's about the roads using vehicles and having vehicles. So it's about the physical infrastructure. I'm very pleased with the partnership that we have with Cedar, Asikap, and Polis. Notably, Sergio in the panel here, one of my friends, um, running this uh, with colleagues in Cedar, where we have a very intensive discussion. How should we see the layout of the roads in the future? What about digital twins for automated driving? So the road infrastructure, traffic signs, speed limits, how can we put it in a digital format and having it in our clouds of the OEMs to make automation happen? But it's also about digital infrastructure. Not only about 5G, that's a buzzword, but about uh, low hanging fruit in terms of legacy uh, framework that we need to upgrade in terms of uh, with speed, bandwidth, and latency. So user adaptation and user adoption. I know the Law Commission in, in, in England and Wales done a magnificent survey on this, uh, mostly on automated driving systems, how to adapt for the user. That's another big ticket. It's not only about vehicles and roads, it's about actually the driver. Yeah? And finally, r and &I. And, and I think we do not have to spend too much time on that. The SECAM partnership is a fantastic initiative which we support with UCAR. And I think we're going to make it forward uh, together with the OEM suppliers and the academic community and the roads. So thank you for that. Looking forward to the next question. Thank you very much indeed. I, I like your kitchen analogy at the start. Um, <laughs> so we're, we'll, we'll see uh, whether we get the recipe right. Uh, Serge Van Damme, let's, um, you already talked about uh, road infrastructure. Go, so from the road's perspective, Serge, uh, what, what, how can you make CCAM work? Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, also, um, one thing I would like to add to your introduction is that I'm, uh, besides co-chairing the CEDAR Working Group on Connectivity, Automation and Data, I'm also uh, starting actually uh, this week uh, or last week when we had the first General Assembly, uh, we'll be uh, co-chairing the uh, CCAM partnership in the Administrative Board together with the colleagues from uh, Bosch and uh, BMW. So that's one, I think, another example of where we... Um, that is mostly the, the first and most important condition is that we work together as sectors. Yeah? And uh, we as road operators, we are really happy with the strong cooperation that has now uh, been formed between sectors. Um, as Joost and I often state, uh, well, we, we 
essentially served the same people, uh, the people who are driving on the roads with their cars, who are transporting goods. And um, the, this cooperation between automotive uh, and, of course, um, uh, the supply sector. Um, and uh, the, the infrastructure manager is the most essential condition to make CCAM work. Um, and uh, as we are working through this integrated mobility system of users, vehicles, and infrastructure, um, these technological solutions, they are a means to an end. Eh? And the end is uh, green, safe, and efficient transport for all, as, as uh, Henry Bollelai has also indicated. And um, as we're looking at the part of infrastructure, it is crucial also to make CCAM work. Road operators can upgrade existing infrastructure, and we can adjust future designs uh, of roads, and we can implement digital layers, as Joost mentioned, to support CCAM. Um, and, and this high-quality digital information uh, from a trusted source that can create awareness beyond the sensor horizon, and especially at higher speeds on motorways that will be uh, needed, of course. Um, also, I think a starting point there could be to develop a common framework as we have now the operational design domain. Uh, we could couple that with the infrastructure support levels for automated driving. And so two nice acronyms where we say ODD and ISAT should be coupled. Um, and where do we find the match between those? That is urgent for the stakeholders, um, uh, especially for, for automotive and, and road operators and their investments in the pre-deployment uh, phase. Um, but we do have to recognize that, that infrastructure life cycles are much longer than vehicle life cycles and public investments in, in infrastructure have to be carefully considered. So we can only spend our money once. We should spend it on the right things, of course. And, um, and we are building CCAM into an existing transport system. We're not, not, it's not a green field. There is an enormous base of roads and, and vehicles already existing. And what we will call the mixed fleet, uh, where we are integrating something new into an existing system, um, is, a, is a reality for at least two decades. Uh, most of the cars that we'll be driving around in 2030 um, are already on the road, um, at least a large part of them. And um, so, therefore, we are really happy with the CCAM partnership, also uh, with, the, with the effort the Commission has made to, to, uh, to move us forward, to join forces. Uh, coordinated research, de the, uh, yeah, development and deployment across Europe is critical. And learning, creating knowledge and sharing experiences in the partnership will, will really help accelerate innovation. Thank you very much indeed. And I mean, that the point you make that the infrastructure life cycle much longer, obviously that is really key to everything, isn't it, from your point of view. So Sophie Veniston from uh, Drive Sweden, give us a sense from your perspective uh, exactly then how are we going to deploy CCAM? What, what, what can you do and what, what help could you, do you need from other people? Yes, as, as you mentioned um, early on here, Dry Sweden is one of Sweden's strategic innovation programs funded by the government through Vinova Swedish Energy Agency Informas. And we work towards future mobility systems for both people and goods that are sustainable, safe and accessible for all, uh, in particular with a focus then on automation, digitalization and sharing. And first of all, then we are when we're talking about making CCAM work, we can't think of it uh, as a purely from a purely technological perspective, it's so many dimensions and uh, we must make sure that the effects of it will be a sustainable and safe society and um, more efficient and more convenient for the end users and preferably also contributing to the European competitiveness, as we've heard. So with this in mind, of course, it's a rather broad approach we need to take. And, and uh, we believe that the efficiency aspect is extremely important uh, and that's uh, we use the technology to make both the infrastructure and the vehicles more efficient. Uh, because if travel by individual cars gets too cheap or too convenient, we risk a development that is not at all sustainable. So um, the development of mobility as a service uh, for people and more consolidated and seamless freight delivery system will be absolutely crucial. And these uh, are new services that demand totally new ways of new business models and data sharing between stakeholders that we are not used to. So we're talking uh, about a system transformation where we need to get out of our traditional pipelines. And the need for a system transformation leads, of course, to new ways of working. And we are working around five components uh, that we believe are totally necessary. So I mentioned already the, the need for data sharing between actors uh, and the digital infrastructure we've heard about, uh, but also uh, a need to challenge old business models, uh, policies and regulatory frameworks that are not adapted to tomorrow's solutions, city planning processes, 
and the involvement of the end users in developing uh, these new services and, and solutions. Because if CCAM is not really solving anything for the users, or if it doesn't contribute to a cheaper, better, more convenient transport, it won't be successful. So um, the, this, the CCAM um, uh, partnership is, is a, a very good form of a new cooperation that will be needed. So. What we will need from everybody is really the understanding and willingness to invest time in collaboration because more people within the organizations must be encouraged to collaborate. Uh, they must be allowed to spend time on that, including the academia. Uh, and we must also deeply involve actors that we normally don't, don't connect with mobility, such as like we have in our partnership, like the telecom business really involved real estate owners, technology providers, insurance companies. Uh, for example, half of our members um, are uh, SMEs or startups, which also shows that a lot of innovation is driven from that, from that sector. So uh, when the collaboration works as its best is when we really build on actual problems uh, and that, that the individual organizations, they can't solve it by themselves. So together, um, we can create this joint understanding about the time horizons that we've heard about, uh, goals, um, and build trust that is not so easy in a digital format like we are today, but still something that will be a key word uh, in the development forward interesting bringing in lots of other partners not just the obvious ones if you like so thank you we'll talk some more about that um jessica we want to hear from you now from the legal perspective uh, you're from the law commission of england and wales give us a bit of an insight then of uh, how you think that that ccam can actually be deployed and what 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 sort of partnerships do you imagine that you need to be involved in Yes, yeah, thank you so much. I think one of the biggest sea changes that we have with this technology uh, introduction is the need to completely overhaul how we regulate road traffic. Um, at the moment, drivers are at the actual absolute center of how we enforce road traffic regulation. Yours was saying we need to optimize road traffic rules. It's, I think, one of those absolute um, sea change moments where we're moving from a place where we have a fragmentation of responsibility for how we move on the roads um, to a place where we're actually um, going to much greater concentration, much fewer actors, companies, rather than individuals that are deciding how we drive on roads. And that means that there's a complete transformation also in how we need to hold these actors accountable uh, because humans fail in very different ways than companies do. So the whole way that the legal system needs to interact with CCAM um, is based much more on processes and building safe systems as opposed to now where you have much more emphasis on say criminal responsibility of individuals uh, you know that get tired or drowsy that just doesn't apply at all uh, when you're thinking about a, a kind of CCAM um, context so I think that um, change in architecture of how we think about uh, regulating this whole area is probably the biggest change um, that I see and to do that, we absolutely need the input from uh, manufacturers. Um, they understand their products much better than anyone else can, certainly than regulators. Um, and I really like the Russian proverb, uh, which is, you know, to trust, but verify. So we need to have, we have to trust them because they understand it better than anyone else. But there's also a really important need for regulators to also support them by verifying and also building that governance around these systems so that uh, the general public can feel greater confidence in them and uh, therefore be more accepting and supporting the rollout of this technology on a big ODD scale. Indeed, and that trust in governance was something we, we addressed uh, yesterday in one of our sessions, it's clearly very, very central. So we, thank you very much, that's great. Just to remind you, by the way, do send questions on Slido that we will get to in a moment. Um, now we're going to hear from Mohammed from the UITP, the International Association of Public Transport. Um, so delighted to see you. And so give us a sense then from the public transport perspective um, about deployment and what help you need, what partnerships you imagine, you know, how do we make it work? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be part of this uh, of this panel. 
Uh, yeah, UITP has has been working on on topics related to CCAM with our members and with the European Commission since the beginning of the CCAM platform, actually, and even before during the ITS platform. And it's obvious for us that uh, CCAM only works if only if it is integrated as shared mobility and not as uh, independent fleets or even more or even worse, I would say, individual automated cars or automated individual automated vehicles. So that's uh, if we want CCAM to work, we have to we need to have this in mind, and we can elaborate later on on that on how this is uh, could be could be uh, could be feasible. Uh, and for public transport, here we are speaking about uh, autonomous systems rather than automated vehicles. We, we 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 it means that we should include the vehicle, the operation control center, the connected infrastructure, the customer app, and so on. So it's important to have this comprehensive approach and not focus on the automated or autonomous vehicles uh, only. So that's uh, important. If you wanted to make it work, we need the systemic approach. That's very important, and, and we need to look to this system from the perspective of the users, and, and, and that's uh, essential. Uh, also, one important aspect uh, to make it work is, the, uh, is to involve the public transport authorities, the public transport operators uh, in, the, in the planning approach. Uh, when we speak about deployment, it's important because at the end they are the, they have the experience in managing fleets, and so it's important that we involve them in when we define how this uh, fleets of uh, vehicles will be will be uh, uh, will be implemented. Um, also, very important, uh, essential actually, is the that we should we should keep the people at the heart of uh, of the the the, the, the system means that we should answer the actual citizens' needs. Uh, it's, it's not about the technology itself. It's not about the vehicle itself. It's about how we are going to use this technology to answer the expectations of people, the mobility expectations of, uh, of people. So it's important that if we, want, if we want CCAM to work, it's important that it is inclusive, it is accessible. Uh, it uh, it's, it's, it's includes the special needs as well. So that's that's essential. Uh, the, this inclusivity is is the the raison d'être of public transport. And so uh, when we talk about CCAM, we have to take this into into consideration. And I would say, as long as we focus on technology only, CCAM will not work. So you ask me the question, how we can make CCAM work? I know how we, we can we can make a trail also if we can, if we focus on technology. So. It's essential that we focus on the service it delivers to the people and take the people expectations into consideration. Thank you very much indeed. And we heard a great example from Gothenburg yesterday, how uh, there's a pilot going on just outside the city, you'll no doubt know it, where there's sort of some tiny little minibuses, but that's in a rural area, which is not normally reached by public mm -hmm. transport. So indeed. that is serving, a, 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 you know, citizens' needs. So thank you. Thank uh, you. Let's have a look at the Slido um, and see what we... <laughs> by 2030, automotive mobility will be deployed at large scale in Europe. 41% say slightly agree, 30% say slightly disagree, 16% um, totally disagree, and 13% uh, to say totally agree. So slightly agree. There's a sort of bit of sitting on the fence there. Wonderful. I want to ask the same question to every one of our panellists before we just move on. Just yes, no. So um, let's see. Yes, what would, what, what would you have said? In, would you have said slight, of these things slightly agree? Oh. Uh, I would say that's privacy data protection. I wouldn't say it. No, I'm kidding. Um, I've said slightly agree. You slightly agree. Okay. Slightly. <laughs> okay, uh, Serge. I said slightly disagree. <laughs> slightly disagree. Okay. Um, and what about what about uh, Sophie? Yeah, I was also quite optimistic and said slightly agree. <laughs> okay. And Jessica. Well, if I managed to unmute my mic, I also slightly agreed. Okay. And Mohammed. Your, your microphone, Mohammed. Your microphone. If we speak, if we speak about mobility for everyone, I disagree. But I am sure for public transport, it, we will make a lot of progress. Okay, okay. So we've got a sort of a movement of, of ambition there and, and optimism. So let's let's now um, talk a little bit more about the kind of the barriers that that that, that um, need to be overcome. I mean, we've touched upon some of them. Um, 
But if we're going to actually, you know, move on, what are we going to do? I mean, if we're going to get, so we perhaps get into a little bit more detail now. Um, so from the infrastructure side, um, Serge, what would you say in terms of improving situation and, and where, what's the, what's the real big barriers that you've got to get over? Well, I think it was mentioned uh, already. I think the, the um, uh, legislation is one of the important parts we have to solve. Uh, and we have to think about how do we um, um, transition from just people being responsible for all interactions in, in, in traffic and transport, also to finding a way to um, a transition between an automated system and, and, and a, a human driver. I think that is one of the important questions to, to solve uh, and, and really think about. So that also has to do with how do you um, uh, provide more information to vehicles? So I think also connectivity, um, it's not just automation, but also connectivity too is, is a very important uh, issue to solve. We've done a lot of work on that topic and over the past few years, uh, there's also been a lot of discussion, but still it is very promising to help us expand uh, just beyond the visual horizon of uh, vehicles. And do you think, do you, do you have a good um, partnership and, and conversation with the manufacturers, with all the people that you need to speak to? Yeah, I think we've ha actually there, we have very much improved over the last two years. Um, and um, I, we're, we're now really working closely with the automotive sector um, and working towards uh, future projects as well. Um, I also, I would hope that we could do the same with the, uh, uh, with the telecommunication sector, uh, where it is, this is the challenge that we now we, we are now facing in this, uh, these new developments, that you need to combine sectors that were previously unconnected. Uh, and then we saw the same in, in, the, uh, in the first stage of electromobility, where electricity providers had to work together with the automotive sector. They, they never knew each other, had any, didn't have anything to do. So that, I think, is one of the big challenges, finding uh, connections between sectors, uh, developing common ground, developing uh, profitable bu business models for all. Um, yeah. Okay, and so let me ask you then from, from the manufacturing side, because we're hearing that um, really it's the, the huge, it can't just be technology. Everyone's been saying that it's, it's got to be the people element and also the regulatory element. So, um, you know, where do you see the, the main barriers from your perspective? Well, I think in terms of people, um, it's managing expectations. You had a good question indeed. Uh, when do we expect automated vehicles, level four, five even? Um, it's about managing expectations. What is automation? What is it not? What is autopilot and what is assisted pilot? It's two different things. And and how to use this in, a, in an optimal way so that the consumer, the consumer, uh, me, me and you, exactly uh, know what it is. Um, secondly, it takes two to tango on all this. Um, we are producing these vehicles, and you see every brand has is really promising on this one. Uh, but we need the infrastructure, physical and digital, and there's still a lot of way to go there. Um, and Sergi is right, the life cycle is different for the physical infrastructure part. It's public funding, etc. We are private companies, uh, stock listed, so that, that's another cycle. Uh, when it comes to digital infrastructure, it's also the cooperation we have with the telecoms and the IT sector. We have a very intensive cooperation with, with them, uh, with CLEPA as well, IATA, uh, that's European Automotive Alliance and Telecoms Alliance. The other one is 5G AA, more structured cooperation on, on, on deployment of long range uh, cellular, uh, CB2X and long range. And that's helpful, these cooperations. It's like we have with cities, uh, with, with the CEDAR and ASICAP community. So it's about learning by doing and seeing is believing for the consumer. It's like electrification. We have all these electric vehicles very much uh, ahead of the standards and uh, I would say the, the, the commitments that we did for Europe for the Green Deal. Now we need to drive these vehicles and to put them into charging modes. And there we need the infrastructure rollout. Uh, so this takes two to tango at least. Uh, and the same for traffic crews, I mentioned that and uh, um, the colleagues in the panel as well. Um, we need to adapt somewhat the traffic crew. In Sweden, uh, for, sorry, Finland allows level four and five. Germany has adapted the uh, changes to the legislation. France has a new strategy. Um, so we, it's a patchwork for us. It would be ideal to have digital twins of that for our HD maps. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, and Sophie, you talked about challenging old business models uh, in your opening remarks. So th tell us a bit more about that and or, or um, anything else in terms of the barriers that have got to be got over. 
Yes, because I think definitely that it's those more organizational uh, business model um, challenges that are very complex and that we need to involve uh, a whole value chain to really see that the whole uh, CCAM work, not only that, taking this broader perspective then of course with the uh, new services and so on to make it more efficient. So that will of course take time and it's hard to predict how fast that that actually can go but it's definitely a complexity when it comes to the roles and responsibilities and when that is unclear it's of course uh, a risk that everybody just sits and well it's not our responsibility and then yeah of course that that is a hinder and also when which is both Serge and Joe was touching upon when innovation processes in different sectors now need to take part more or less at the same time uh, and they are normally conducted probably totally different pace, uh, particularly when we need to involve authorities and cities and so on who plan in a very long-term perspective. That's, of course, a challenge that, that won't be so uh, easy to, to solve. So if we're talking about policy building, policy making, and Sophie, do you, do you think that, I mean, the demonstrators that are obviously really very important, is that a, an important part of policy making, to just be able to have the facts there to build the policy around? Definitely. I think what we are we are working with is policy lab method that really use a case uh, where we involve the, the necessary actors and really dig into the uh, the concrete problems and we try to learn by doing uh, and then also by by learning by doing and then we can also provide the recommendations to okay this needs to be solved otherwise we we, we are stuck in in old solutions so definitely important. Thank you. Um, Jessica, um, you talked about a sea change in terms of the regulation. Uh, we've also got a question in from the public, which I'll ask you in a moment. Um, but um, so where, where, how do you start this sea change then? Where, where, where do, what's the process? I think the key to it is actually looking at the safety assurance scheme and focusing on a safe systems approach where instead of um, focusing on the sanctions on individual cases when things go wrong, to make sure we have systems in place that we understand what happened and are able to feed the learning by doing, which has come across from every other speaker as well, and feed that into the system. Because especially with such a transformative and new technology, we're gonna know less at the beginning. So we have to have methods to be able to learn quickly and effectively and safely as we progress and therefore educate the public and the regulators, as well as of course, uh, using all the innovation from um, the AV, um, you know, CCAM developers and make sure yeah. that we work together to be able to, uh, you know, regulate in a way that is entirely different than just uh, sanctioning particular individuals on the roads. But th there's an interesting question here, which actually l leads well from what you're saying. It says, how does machine learning and the black box problem affect the regulator's ability to trust and verify? Should OEMs, the manufacturers, uh, ensure explainable AI? So, you know, you're talking about needing facts, but actually a lot of it is not as clear as one would perhaps need or want it to be for regulators Absolutely. anyway. Absolutely, yes. And I mean, the ultimate black box system is our brain, right? Humans, <laughs> our own actions are incredibly difficult to, to understand. And what we need is an ability to interrogate what happened and investigate and understand it properly. And there are lots of um, academics and um, uh, experts that are looking at ways in which we can uh, make sure that we can interrogate systems to make sure that they comply with requirements which are being uh, put forward. Responsibility sensitive safety, which is uh, one of the many different methods uh, that are being put forward by companies like Mobileye, for example, are looking at parameters that we can translate some of our more um, human rules uh, about driving carefully into more mathematical formulae in ways that are more translatable to how a machine behaves. So I think some of those techniques um, can be helpful, but I think nothing can substitute the learning from actual vehicles on the field and how they are behaving. And we need to have a much stronger emphasis on making sure that vehicles behave how they say they will behave. We can't just trust it at the beginning. We need to have really good systems to be able to capture any departures from how they are meant to be functioning. So that's like a weighting of the system 
But if you think about um, a human driver has just like a 20 minute test and can go and drive on the road, would there be an equivalent for an automated car, a 20 minute test or, you know, uh, is that enough or as they're, they're learning and it will take a lot longer for regulators to accept that it is safe? Absolutely. In true legal style, I would say I object to the, you know, the 20 minute test because in actual, in fact, humans have had, you know, 18 years you know, from birth of training about how to avoid obstacles, how to interact with each other. Um, you have an eyesight test, right, to be able to uh, have a car, but no one is interrogating whether if you see something, you're going to hit it. Whereas we know from experience, unfortunately, that some of these automated systems, they even upon detecting an object don't necessarily behave how we would want it to and incidents can happen. So there's an entirely different set of assumptions just because something behaves uh, well in one scenario doesn't mean it will necessarily behave in an acceptable manner in a different one. So we can't possibly cover all of them in advance. So we've got to do our best to be as inclusive as possible in identifying scenarios and broad um, and include society in that so that we don't forget, you know, there are wheelchair users, for example, or people with horses that need to be taken into account, you know, when we're navigating the road environment. But it's also very important, and it always goes back to the fact that we need to improve our knowledge and understanding of how these work, and then improve the way that we regulate as we progress, but really do our very best at the beginning, working with the developers, working with the public, and inclusively to try and figure out where we can best start from. And the incubators are essential, uh, just as has been mentioned by Sophie and, and others. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And Mohammed, from, from a public transport perspective, um, how do you integrate uh, the connected vehicles and automated vehicles with mass transit? Because, you know, the, there is, this is a big, big issue because clearly there'd be very long transition periods and, and you know, the two are working together. Indeed, it's it's a big issue, but it is uh, uh, it's an it's 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 an issue that we 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 have to we have to succeed. We 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 have to to implement. We have to find a solution for that because if we, you know, uh, the, the role of public transport in this uh, uh, autonomous mobility is, is is very important. If we if you remember this lockdown periods during the pandemic, you know what we have realized is the space which is uh, dedicated to cars. It's a space which is wasted for cars. And we have to, we, really, this issue of space is key in the development of CCIM. And, and, and we have to find solutions which will make the use of space the most efficient possible. And, and we know that the most efficient modes are public transport, walking, and cycling. So it's important that we, we integrate this uh, autonomous mobility together with public transport. It's important that we. We have a, we integrate mass public transport with on-demand and shared autonomous mobility. That's important in a way that we we uh, uh, we allow people to plan their trips not just station to station but door to door. So in a way that they will have the the right mode that they want according to the purpose of the trip, the time of the day or the day of the week, according to the price they can they can afford to, to pay, etc. So at the end of the day, they don't need to own a car. So that's that's what is important. It is really to to offer uh, a, a comprehensive mobility solution to people, and so the, the 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 integration between mass public transport and shared on-demand autonomous mobility, or mass or autonomous mass public transport and autonomous shared and on-demand mobility is key for the uh, for the for the success. Okay, so it changes the picture. It's very interesting. Um, we've got a, a, a question here, um, which I think I'll put to yours, which is about, it says, um, you said we need new technologies. In CCAM, we have too many. Do you think the multiple standards in V2V, V2X may hinder the development in connected mobility? I have to say, I don't totally understand that question. So I think uh, maybe just to explain it a bit. I'll try to explain you. It'll be a bit of pedagogical uh, exercise. V2V and V2I is communication between vehicles and vehicles with infrastructure. V2X being um, everything on the other side. It can be an insurance company, can be repair and maintenance, can be all kinds of other devices on the other side of the vehicle. We need to talk the same language in order to understand each other. If I'm talking to you Chinese and you're talking to me Japanese, probably we will not understand. We need some metadata, some meta communication. 
So we need a third language, kind of Esperanto in between. The same is valid for communication technologies. And the speed of evolving of these communication technologies puts a kind of an issue, uh, I would say a kind of philosophical issue, when you have cooperative systems. Cooperative systems have to work with each other. One plus one is three. When my vehicles give a signal to the road authorities of Serge, he will be using that signal and that information that he should send back. He will send back information as well and even data. We have to do that in the same data sets that we understand each other with the same technology. Otherwise, we will not yeah, be listening to each other. That's why we have short range and long range. And even within the short range, we have at least two standards. Uh, and for vehicle manufacturers, also for road authorities, it's, it's paramount to make the right choice. Um, we don't have built-in systems yet that can allow all technologies in one box, a kind of black box, like your mobile phone, working with Wi-Fi and cellular. Um, we desperately want this as SAP, and we need to put it in vehicles so that they are, can communicate. Now, today, we have brands having chosen for one specific standard because they're producing the vehicles for between now and three years further. So you need to be a bit uh, a crystal ball what will happen in the future. Others have belief in, in long range technology and accelerating 5G, 4G, 5G. Give you one example where it fails, this cooperative system is with eCall. eCall today is an emergency call that is put in every vehicle in the pipe, mandatory. When something goes wrong, well, these things are type approved or are mandatory with 2G and 3G chipset. That's all technology. Yeah. yeah. Now we are we are still mandatory. We have to produce these vehicles with all technology, and they are not compatible with 4G or even 5G. So they're not interoperable, neither they are compatible. So there is no forward and backwards compatibility, which gives a problem because if a telco operator would stop the 2G network for all kinds of reasons, we're not able to send an emergency call. Yeah with impact for a driver, with impact for safety. So we need to have a holistic view on that. And I know it's not an easy one. We got this with CITS, we will have it with other things. Um, so happy to, to be uh, on the stage for that one in another seminar, I think. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, it isn't an easy, quite clearly from your answer. Yeah. Um, we, there's a question here for Serge. Uh, it says, CEDA mainly represents national road authorities. How do you take into account infrastructural requirements and challenges of local authorities and urban environments? So that it says there are challenging environments for CCAM. Yeah, that's, that's very true. So those environments are quite different, of course as to uh, a, a more structured and, and uh, uh, less complex environment on a motorway. And especially, I think there's an enormous potential for CCAM to um, uh, save lives in, in cities and busy traffic where you have vulnerable road users, such as uh, pedestrians and, and cyclists. So uh, there's an enormous potential there. Um, and also, I think that's quite well addressed if you look at the strategic research and innovation agenda that was drafted for the CCAM partnership. Uh, also, um, at this point, we have seen that not so many cities uh, have become a member of the CCAM partnership. So uh, I would return this question also with a call to action to, uh, to the cities to become a member of the partnership. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, if we're changing the architecture of our legislative processes, what new opportunities might we have to drive societal needs, such as making ISAD less about support and more about vehicle requirement. Um, so I, I guess this is one for Jessica. Um, yes, I mean, I think in terms of uh, changing the legal infrastructure and um, embedding a better understanding, you know, of how our roads must be cooperating and working, probably I would actually defer to Joost on his understanding of, you know, the whole aspect of, um, data transfer and compatibility between systems speaking to each other and mandating a, a sort of a more standardized approach um, on that, um, sort of helping um, you know, the infrastructure speak you know, with the vehicles and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, I think I wouldn't have that much more to add. I don't know if anyone else wants to add anything to that. I'm not seeing everybody, I can't. Maybe, let me bring um, Sophie in for uh, another, another question, which is, um, 
CCAM, it says, forces different stakeholders to work together. I'm sure it doesn't force, but, I mean, it will bring people together. Um, and how are we doing in re regard to defining roles and responsibilities? Because you were talking about having to bring in so many other partners and, and um, you know, SMEs uh, really, really being so inclusive in, in, this, in the road ahead. So uh, what would you say about this, about defining roles and responsibilities? Well, I would I would say that the best way is uh, that we have talked about really these um, uh, living labs or uh, demonstrations uh, where where we actually need to bring in the actors that are um, possible possible actors to take uh, the service or the, the technology forward into commercialization, so that we have the actors uh, already from the beginning involved and preferably from the whole chain. Um, so that's I think is the best way to. To learn and um, well, I saw also another question there about the business testing business models, and I think also um, if we don't test the business models uh, in real time or sharp, so to say, it it's also very hard to take it from uh, test to deployment because then it's a nice test, but nobody will take it further. So it's absolutely crucial to to involve that. We do it, for example, in mobility as a service, um, yeah, tests, for example. If I may, okay. if I yes. may, just because uh, following what uh, what Sophie just said, I think uh, it's important to to to, to emphasize the, the importance of large scale demonstrations, and and to because uh, we can uh, we can learn a lot from these uh, large scale demonstrations, and uh, they are needed for technology testing, for uh, raising citizens awareness, uh, for raising their their trust also, and identifying and testing new business models and and, and services. So. I think it's it's important because we are still in this uh, in this learning uh, phase, and so this uh, uh, large de uh, scale demonstration are important. I would like to just to mention that uh, tomorrow uh, we will have uh, UHP will have a session where we can we we will share some lessons and uh, uh, which are part of the show project funded by the European Commission on on that very specific topic. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's a good, a good point to talk about the tomorrow because, of course, there are lots of sessions which are going into all these issues in much more detail. Um, there's a question about digital twins here. <coughs> I've just um, somebody says, oh, Zhang from Zhang Wei. He says, great speech. May I ask how could digital twins support automated driving, and infrastructure could provide common or standard service for automated? A driving vehicle, how, uh, and how CCAM could contribute this in its deployment. Uh, well, who was it mentioned digital twins? Was it was it you, Yos, or was it Serge? Yeah. It was me. It was me. Do well, you want to happy, this question? Happy to take this one. Katie. We'll see whether Serge has got anything to add, but go on. Okay. Um, now, on digital twins, um, that's, I know it's a buzzword, but it's actually a digital representation of the physical attributes. If you drive autonomously with your car, with the car that's driving you actually, um, on the road, this car will be activated by um, systems of the OEMs in the back in the cloud to the extended vehicle system for data sharing. And will say you need to brake, you need to steer, you go to the left, to the right, etc. You need to accelerate or decelerate. That's not you anymore. That's the car will do it. Or the driver, driver will be out of the loop. Yeah meaning that the car will have to sense, feel, scan the environment, literally scan what's happening around the car. It's like you do today, like Jessica mentioned, for 15 years, uh, you have been doing that for all your life, um, kind of algorithms that you have in your mind. Now the car has to do that now in the future, and the OEMs have to develop these systems. So we need, ideally, we would need a digital copy of the physical environment, yeah? Of, is there a traffic sign? Is there a road uh, uh, lane marking or not? Um, how to cope with, with um, weather conditions and so on, how to cope with intersections, with complex systems for the ODD. So ideally, we would have digital twins, so copy-paste, uh, delivered by the road authorities, by municipalities and cities. Um, we need, ideally, that also in a harmonized format. Traffic authorities work with Datex2, some others work with Sensoris from cars, for example. Would be good to have a, at least the metadata correct, that we know what we are talking about, and secondly, that we talk in the same language with the same uh, technology and standards. So it's an open question. We discuss it with, with the road community. Um, but it's also a question that we have tackled in the CCAM platform uh, and the CCAM partnership as well. 
So, um, yeah, it's one of the future behavior in the cloud system. Thank you. Okay, thanks. We're, we're kind of running out of time, and I want to relaunch the, um, the Slido poll and see whether um, anyone's changed their minds on to whether you think that there will be wide-scale uh, automated mobility um, by 2030. So if you'd like to um, vote on this again. Um, oh, my goodness, at the moment it's, it's neck and neck. Oh, no, it's changing now. But in the meantime, I, I'd also like, I'm going to come to, just to, for you to be thinking, my panellists, I just want you to, in one sentence, or not really, no, no more than a sentence, I want you to, if you had a magic wand, the one thing we've got to get right if uh, we are going to bring, make CCAM a reality by 2030. I know it's complex, and I know there are lots of things, but for you, the real priority thing that has got to be done, maybe if you could, I could ask you all that question while we just have a look at this. So it's not changed dramatically, actually, during our conversation. Most people still slightly agree that we will have uh, automated mobility by 2030. Um, but you were, the, the panel was more or less in in uh, line with the Slido anyway. So let me ask us, the, um, you just literally, um, very, very, very briefly, so just what is, you know, the big, big priority to get right if we're going to be able to deploy in the next few years? Yeah, for me, it's an um, agile, one-stop shop legal framework at European level. Okay. Uh, Serge. Uh, for me, it's the full understanding of how uh, a vehicle, a human, and infrastructure interact. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sophie? Uh, I think we need more um, knowledge about um, what effects uh, on the uh, climate and uh, sustainability um, effects that these solutions actually would give in order to get uh, make the politicians to take brave decisions. Okay, that's good. Um, uh, Jessica? Um, I think we need a strong public debate about how safe is safe enough for an automated vehicle and manage expectations about that. Okay, that's, that's, that's a good one because yesterday when we were doing our Slido polls, um, safety came out as the big word as the positive side, whereas of course a lot of people, um, the general public would, would consider that that would be the, the negative, that they were worried about safety. But, um, you know, it's getting that message of safety across, isn't it? Uh, Mohammed? For me, it's very easy, it's but not to allow fully autonomous vehicles to be individually owned. Fine. Thank you very much indeed. So you've, done, you've sort of, that's uh, done my job for me now, my conclusions <laughs> from the panel. But thank you all very much. That was a really nice discussion. But, um, uh, I mean, you, you, we, the messages that were coming through is, is I mean, this regulation needed for predictability was really, really important. Um, and um, we heard about, you know, the infrastructure challenges with the, the extra, you know, the, the, um, the life cycle of infrastructure being a challenge. Data sharing, really important. The need to challenge old business models and bring in so many different players into the partnerships. That's so, so important. But, but the word sea change, I mean, sea change is, is just the word, isn't it? It's, it's a sea change in terms of the regulation, but it's in terms of everything that we're going into. Um, but um, there's a lot, a lot happening. There's a lot to be done, but you, you've kind of um, brought out some of the key things that, that in, in the discussions there. So thank you very much indeed. Um, we are going to take a break now, actually, um, for lunch, and I'm just trying to find my notes. I'm, I, you see, my, this is getting like Henrik Hollelai's office now. I'm making this like my office at home, which is not to be seen in public. Um, so just to say that we're going to come back again in an hour's time at 13.15. Uh, we'll be discussing investment really important investment for deployment. And then we will have our international panel uh, where we're going to be hearing from uh, speakers from Australia, US, Singapore, South Korea, and Japan. So remember, you can network. If you want to go to, to the home uh, page, you will see how you can contact people, contact people, uh, participants or exhibitors. You can visit the virtual exhibition as well. So we will see you at 1315 CET. Look forward to it. Thank you.